I'd like to introduce Dr. John Boone from University of California, Davis, and he's going to be talking about some of the dose metrics. Um, well, uh, I'm starting off with a discussion of uh, measurements and indices in CT dose, and what this really is uh, um, uh, is a discussion of sort of the, the current standards and, and probably where the standards are going. Uh, as a result of a lot of activity in CT dose measurement over the last few years. Part of this is, uh, uh, we'll show you some of the efforts of the uh, uh, International Commission on Radiological Units, the ICRU's um, report uh, that um, uh, I've been involved with, and, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. So, um, necessary disclosures required by my university. So here's an outline, and I thought I'd start with a brief introduction of dose metrics. Most of you in the room uh, are familiar with these, and then go on and, and talk about some of the new metrics and how we might uh, use those in a future uh, CT dose ass assessment to improve the accuracy of patient dosimetry. So um, uh, we're all aware that the evolution of CT scanners and, uh, has been impressive over the last 40 uh, years or so. And uh, I'll just point out that the evolution of the concomitant uh, dosimetry has been less than impressive. In fact, it started out with the CTDI concept uh, and only recently as a result of a lot of um, issues, including accidents, um, uh, have there been a spurry of uh, activity uh, all pretty much centered in um, uh, the AAPM and other bodies as well. SB 1237 is the law in California that Tony will talk about. So it all started really in uh, 1981 when this paper was published by Tom Shope uh, about CTDI and I'll just point out that the I uh, does stand for index and it was really never intended uh, to be a patient dose um, a metric, uh, although uh, it's been morphed into that uh, more recently over the last uh, um, 30 years or so. Uh, so we, uh, nevertheless, it is uh, encoded by the IEC, the International Electrotechnical uh, Committee. Um, and as a result, there, uh, the CTDI is, in, is a part of the laws of many nations around the world and uh, getting rid of it, therefore, um, would take, uh, it will take uh, decades if we, uh, as a community, decide to get uh, rid of it, and that's uh, unknown at this point. So the, uh, the basic tools known to you uh, all, I'm sure, is a 32 centimeter polymethyl methacrylate phantom, a 16 centimeter, the head phantom, as well as a 100 millimeter uh, pencil chamber, air ionization chamber, typically. And uh, the, the technique that we use uh, with these tools is to uh, uh, insert the probe into a phantom, plug all the empty holes with Lucite, uh, to do an axial scan, uh, and uh, a measure the CTDI 100, both in the periphery and the center. I showed once a peripheral measurement here. Oftentimes we make four measurements, and there's usually four or more holes around the phantom, and that's to address the fact that uh, the bottom hole will uh, include more attenuation from the table and the top hole will not. So oftentimes CTDI 100 peripheral is the average of uh, uh, two or more uh, individual measurements. Here's a picture of uh, the phantom uh, in position for such measurements with the chamber in the center hole, as you can tell. So we take these, um, and I'll just draw your attention to the uh, reference at the bottom of the uh, slide. Uh, Wolfram Leitz uh, published a paper in 1995 which uh, showed that uh, if you uh, do a, a two-thirds, one-third weighting of the CTDI, it, uh, it led to uh, a, a semi-accurate uh, measurement of the dose at the central slice uh, of um, uh, in that 100 millimeter uh, slice thickness, and that led to the uh, notion of the CTDIW, the weighted CTDI of all. Uh, 1999 came along, and uh, so did uh, helical CT, and we know that in helical CT, dose goes as one over the pitch, so that led to the volume CTDI, CTDI of all, which is uh, CTDIW normalized uh, by pitch. So CTDI uh, vol has come to be codified by the IEC, as I uh, mentioned, and 
Um, I'll just point out that it has, um, uh, it's now required to be on all modern scanners on the console and the RDSR. It's usually in, involved uh, in the, the DICOM header associated with each of the CT uh, images. So a lot of this talk uh, is couched on the fact that the CTDI vol is a ubiquitous quantity that's available on virtually all modern CT scanners. It's available to the technologist, to the medical physicists, and to the radiologist involved at that facility. So um, what it, uh, CTDI uh, vol, which is measured with a 100 millimeter chamber, is really uh, meant to represent a, a the uh, dose at the center of, of a 10 millimeter, uh, uh, of a 100 millimeter uh, CT slice, um, just to keep that in mind. But the reality is, is um, uh, many CT slices, uh, most uh, CT scan uh, protocols uh, have scan length much greater than uh, 10 centimeters. And so in this uh, paradigm, which scan has more dose? And to a first approximation, if we're just talking about the primary um, radiation dose, um, uh, they're the same because dose is a quantity that's uh, normalized by the tissue mass. The longer you're putting more energy in per unit length, but uh, uh, you're also dividing it by uh, uh, equal amounts of increase in, in uh, mass. Um, so uh, that gives, nevertheless, we know that uh, there's more harm done if the same technique is applied in the bottom slide than it is in the top slide, um, small degree of harm. Um, and so that led to the dose length product, which is, is the uh, uh, CTDI vol multiplied by the scan length in centimeters uh, with the units of uh, milligray per uh, centimeter. And I'll just point out that DLP is actually quite an, a useful tool and is probably more related to the patient dose than CTDI vol. And uh, we can show you that since dose is energy over mass, energy equals dose times mass, and, and energy imparted is equal to dose times the mass of the phantom uh, as shown in that, uh, you know, the density with the length and the area of the phantom. If we just uh, divide out uh, rho and, and pi r squared, we have dose times length. So you can see that uh, DLP is really linear related uh, to the energy imparted. So uh, the European Union uh, folks uh, recognized this long ago, as, as many uh, did, and, and they actually uh, developed this uh, data that showed DLP as being uh, an impressively uh, linear function with respect to the effective dose calculated uh, semi-independently. This was actually used the impact uh, dose uh, tool. Um, but that led to this notion that you could multiply DLP times a, a correction factor K uh, to, to estimate the F effective dose. And indeed, TG to, um, uh, APM t Task Group uh, 96 um, sort of surveyed the literature and came up with their own version of K factors, which are uh, specific to the individual body part, uh, head, neck, chest, abdomen, pelvis, uh, uh, as you can see on the chart there. So this is uh, commonly used in, in a CT uh, assessment of, of patients, and it has some controversial aspects to it, specifically the use of effective dose for an individual patient's um, dose, but uh, um, I'm not going to get into that here. So this is a summary of, of a conventional technology for CT dosimetry, and I've talked about the tools, the methods, and the metrics. And uh, these are uh, probably known to most of you who are involved in CT uh, dosimetry in, in the audience. That being said, CT is a great measure if the patient happens to be a 32 centimeter diameter chunk of uh, uh, plastic, but it's really not a good standalone uh, metric for a patient dose, as I alluded to when uh, uh, talking about Tom Cho uh, Cho Chope's uh, um, that's why they called it an index and, and not uh, something else. And there have been a lot of papers over the last um, really 10 years uh, that have been critical of uh, the use of this uh, metric uh, in, uh, if it's not couched. And so um, let's talk about some of the criticisms that have been raised uh, with respect to certain uh, parameters. So with respect to patient size, um, you know, a 32 centimeter uh, diameter uh, patient uh, that happens to be a density of 1.19, which really makes it a, a very large person indeed, someone with a 47 inch waistline um, or 120 centimeters, 
uh, a, a pretty big person, probably on the order of 300 pounds. At UC Davis, I did a study of 68 adult patients at my institution a while ago, and the average patient uh, at, uh, I think it was L5 or uh, so, was um, on the order of 35 centimeters in diameter, uh, uh, 88 centimeters. So um, clearly the phantom is much larger than the average adult patient. Um, and I'll point out that um, uh, you know, this is an increase in diameter, but obviously the area and hence the volume is, is really an 85 percent larger uh, um, uh, by, by mass uh, for the, compared to the average patient. So that's a huge uh, uh, factor there. The consequences of this are if you l use the technique factors, um, KV, MA, pitch, uh, and time, uh, and, and get a CTDI value, uh, valve uh, factor for that, that uh, t definitely uh, underestimates the dose to smaller patients and the underestimation becomes worse as the patient gets smaller, as you can see by those bar charts on the little red dotted line. So that um, gave uh, rise to AAPM task group uh, 204, <coughs> excuse me, um, that was actually born uh, on the first CT uh, dose conference uh, that was sponsored by the AAPM in 2010 that was held near the Atlanta airport on April 29th and 30th of that year. And uh, I was at the mic and, and the people from Image Gently, Marilyn Gosky uh, at, and others, Don Frush, uh, essentially uh, went to the mic and, and begged the AAPM uh, to come up with a way in which they could accurately estimate dose to small patients, their pediatric patients. And so um, that's what uh, the genesis of this um, task group uh, was. So um, uh, in this uh, work, uh, four independent research were, uh, groups, uh, the data was uh, concatenated and um, uh, specifically with respect to the um, uh, size metric in, in CT dose. And those groups were Keith Strauss and Tom Toth working independently, and they used the, the phantoms that we're all familiar with, as well as a 10 centimeter phantom to emulate a very small patient. Cynthia McCullough had uh, this large array of, of uh, phantoms that are available commercially. And Mike McNick Gray and his colleagues at UCLA uh, had the voxelized patient um, uh, phantoms and did Monte Carlo. Uh, work and, and in my own uh, lab, uh, uh, call, a postdoc uh, and I uh, um, did uh, similar work. So the bottom two efforts were Monte Carlo based and the top two efforts were physical measurements. And so this um, task group uh, was a combination of, of both uh, ways of computing dose. And to cut to the bottom line, um, uh, essentially when we normalize the data from all of those uh, individual groups by CTDI vol, we just took the data and, and, multi and divided by CTDI vol for the technique factors corresponding to the measurement and plotted it. We, uh, you know, it's not a perfect fit, but it's a, a surprisingly a good fit given the disparity of, of the uh, input. This was never intended to be combined. Uh, these, these were truly four independent working groups. And so we can fit just using um, a simple exponential uh, equation, and you can see the solid line there that uh, uh, is resulting. You can also see the, a the average age of patients from ICRU 74, and I'll just point out that you know a 10 centimeter uh, patient is a pretty small is a, is a, a newborn, um, and uh, th so this is the conversion factor as a function of water equivalent diameter. And I'm not going to talk about that in the interest of time, but uh, if there's Q and A at the end of this, we can f uh, uh, explore that more deeply if you like. I mentioned the ubiqu ubiquitous nature of a CTDI vol. Uh, because these data were divided by it, now you can take your CTDI vol that's present on the uh, scanner before the scan even, or present um, in the dose report, uh, as you see here. You can take that value, figure out what the diameter of the patient is, and then um, do the multiplication. So the CTDI vol of the, uh, used to scan the patient multiplied by that correction factor, that curve, that of course requires the knowledge of the patient diameter equals the size-specific dose estimate, the SSDE. 
I'll point out that CTDI vol is, is measured in air kerma. It's the result of an air ionization chamber, and so the units are in uh, milligray air kerma. Um, the, the F factor, the conversion factor here, includes the, the F factor, the ratio of mu n over rho of, of tissue divided by air, um, in addition to the size uh, correction uh, uh, component of that uh, uh, function. So the output is absorbed dose in tissue or water. Okay, so uh, I just talked about the diameter issue with respect to this phantom, but there is a scan length issue as well. The phantoms are typically 15 centimeters in length. Uh, the scan, uh, the 100 millimeter uh, pencil chamber is only measuring the, the uh, radiation that accumulates in 10 centimeters of the scan. And the reality is, is uh, many abdomen pelvis scans run 40 or even 50 centimeters in taller people, um, and so that uh, smaller scan length that's used to make this uh, measurement uh, has some problems that, uh, that it doesn't really address the clinical reality in CT scanning, especially in the abdomen. So um, I did some uh, research, and I'll just point out this, these curves. So this is an exponential, and this is linear, so semi-log paper. And so this is essentially the uh, line spread function, if you will, for, for 140 kV or 80 kV. Um, and this is the, uh, if you had a delta function or a very narrow collimated CT scan, and we're only measuring the dose with a 100 millimeter pencil chamber. And uh, based upon this data, you can see that when we integrate only this part of the tail, um, you're measuring 62 percent is what uh, that research has shown. If you increase this to 130 millimeters, you're getting 80 percent. Um, if you go to 400 millimeters, 40 centimeters, now you're measuring on the order of 98 percent with 1 percent uh, of the uh, dose lost on either, in, or the, uh, the energy really lost on either uh, side of the scan. So the consequence of that is that the dose profile in CT has an am amplitude, but it has very long scatter tails, and you can see that here. So this was um, a, a co computational effort uh, that I made, and the, d the primary <coughs> dose was exactly the same, and you can see that as the scan length gets uh, greater, um, that the dose at the center of the scan increases up until it reaches an asymptotic value, and uh, that asymptote is reached when you re get to the end of those scatter tails, right? Uh, so that gives us some guidance for how long the phantom needs to be to actually measure, you know, on the order of 98 percent of the dose uh, in uh, the phantom. So if we plot uh, the data, the scan length, the, the relative dose shown in red dots as a function of the scan length, we have this plot here, uh, D0, and I'm just going to remind you that this is the dose at the, at the plane at the center of the phantom um, as a function of scan length, and you see this asymptotic uh, value, and this has been uh, turned by Bob Dixon as uh, the equilibrium dose uh, at uh, the limit of the asymptote there, DEQ. And I'll just point out that if you're measuring a 100 centimeter, uh, 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 10 centimeter scan length, 100 millimeter scan length, that you underestimate DEQ by on the order of 28 percent. Is that a huge factor? No. Is it a something that we can compensate for? Why not? And so this um, curve is essentially uh, described uh, in AAPM report uh, 111. I'll just point out that TG111 uh, preceded uh, TG204. I just chose to describe this in this order, um, preceded it by several years, I think. And so uh, the methodology for measuring that curve, the so-called rise to dose equilibrium <laughs> curve, or H of L, um, is uses not a 100 millimeter long chamber, but a uh, essentially a point detector. Uh, Dixon calls this a farmer chamber, but the manufacturers prefer to call it a thimble <coughs> chamber. And this is an integrating thimble chamber, similar in every way to all the dose uh, chambers that you, you all use. And so we place this at the center of a long phantom, and we do a scan of a given length. We measure the dose, and we plot it. So now we have one point on that H of L curve as a function of scan length. Then we repeat this process with a different scan length and, and yet a different, uh, another scan length, and, and uh, we can build up a, a 
dots on the curve, and, and of course we can fit those and uh, uh, measure this uh, H and L, L curve, the rise to equilibrium curve. <coughs> so uh, uh, Bob and I have been goofing around, and, and there's actually a pretty solid analytic background to uh, this uh, type of um, uh, curve. And given the exponential, it's actually bi-exponential nature of the point spread function that I showed you uh, in a, a previous slide, um, one can fit these terms and it really perfectly, you can actually integrate that bi-exponential and you get this e e e um, equation. And it fits the measured data um, surprisingly well. Uh, Okay, so this uh, gave rise to some discussions about phantoms and radiation meters. That let me just introduce those, and and uh, I'll call this the ICRU AAPM TG200. So TG200 was formed. The, the notion of a phantom became too controversial to ever get TG111 off the ground, and so we agreed to punt on that and defer that, and TG200 is where that was deferred to. And uh, I work closely as the ICRU representative, and, and Mike and McNick Gray and Cynthia McCullough are, are also on the ICRU CT dose uh, report team. And so this has come to be the ICRU AAPM TG200 uh, Phantom. And uh, so you can see a CAD drawing of this as well as the uh, physical um, system here. Here it, it's fairly large, it's polyethylene because that's uh, inexpensive. It's 60 centimeters long. Uh, each of the uh, three modules is 20 centimeters long and weighs you know, on the order of 30 pounds. Um, so the total phantom weight is 90 pounds. And it's not surprising if you want to measure patient dose, you need something out there that emulates the pro scatter properties of something on the order of the size of the patient. Um, so uh, there were criticisms about the mass of the uh, um, system, and we uh, showed, uh, nevertheless, with uh, Diana Cody and Mike McNeil Gray in Denver um, a couple years ago that uh, it m makes good uh, measurements. The H of L curves uh, uh, were as uh, predicted. Um, that was the good news. The bad news is it took all these people to get the thing up on the table. <laughs> And uh, so uh, as a result of this, we actually agreed that uh, we were not going to recommend that the full phantom would be a part of a clinical diagnostic medical physicist toolbox. Rather, that uh, we're in the process now of, of working with the vendors and have them make these H of L curves. And uh, we'll end up suggesting that um, uh, in the field that you just use one module, one of these, uh, uh, which is actually lighter than the CTDI phantom that you're familiar with uh, in, in, instead. So I want to introduce real-time probes. And when I started the ICRU process, sadly, 10 years ago, um, I, I thought that we could, um, you know, the, the, the reality is the, the dose in CT is dynamic. You have the X-ray beam rotating around, X-ray tube rotating around. You've got all this dynamic stuff going on. The, the notion of using a static chamber that only integrates um, over and over and over again uh, seems a little bit old-fashioned to me. And so I worked with two vendors, actually, and one of them um, was a solid-state uh, group. Um, and uh, I think we all prefer air ionization chambers. But um, And then I worked with Paul Sunday at RADCAL and MDH, uh, and uh, that's what I'll describe here. And so. Um, this is the thimble chamber, and, and it's the same chamber that is the integrating chamber, but now we hook it up to an electrometer um, that really is connected to a laptop, and this, this system is actually capable of readout at 10,000 hertz, um, 10 kilohertz. Um, and uh, I'll show you the, the ramifications of both the phantom and, and that radiation uh, probe here. So this is uh, sort of uh, what's also recommended in the ICRU report and I just edited it, and I'll have one more final edit before this comes out. Um, I make no money off of this, and I've spent the last 10 years writing it, so I'm going to go to it to you. But, uh, but uh, uh, I just went through 3,170 edits by the editor, and um, uh, so this will be out probably in a, a month or a month and a half. So now we're going to take this same uh, chamber, but now we're going to call it the real-time thimble chamber. And we place that at the center of the phantom that I uh, showed to you. 
and we're going to make one scan from one end of the phantom to the other end of the phantom, and now we're going to read out the dose rate, not just the integrated dose. We do that, and you can see I build up the, the curve there, and that's as, exactly what the dose trace looks like um, in a, a conceptualized uh, sense. Um, you can see that as the uh, X-ray beam is towards the end of the phantom, you're just measuring scatter. As it gets closer to the probe, you're measuring a more intense scatter, and then you go through the primary plus scatter, and then it goes off to the other side. Uh, you can see it's not symmetrical, and you know the reason why. It's the heel effect, um, and CT scanners all demonstrate a, a real heel effect uh, through the slice thickness, more important for th thicker slices, for thicker collimated beam widths. Um, but we can take this data, and we have a beam profile now, and we can, just in a spreadsheet software, we can integrate that differentially, and we can build that H of L curve. So now we only need to make one scan. It's the full scan through the patient. Um, but uh, we end up with far less um, scanning, and, and so we don't heat up the tube that uh, much. And uh, uh, obviously, it's, say, it's a dose, it's a time-saving uh, tool as well. So uh, now, with these two tools, it's relatively easy um, uh, if you have a forklift to get the phantom up on the table to um, make this H of L um, a curve. And in, indeed, we are, as I mentioned, uh, making these recommendations to vendors, and, and they do have forklifts in their um, facilities where they're staging. Uh, uh, scanners, and so they uh, would have the capability of making these uh, measurements for us. Now, um, I showed you the idealized uh, curve here that I drew. This is a, a physically measured one, and, and you can see that it's <clears throat> got some notches in it, and those notches are the reality of the table. And you can see as the beam rotates around, uh, at, at some point uh, the beam is attenuated by the table, and that's what uh, corresponds to the notch. Um, I'll just po point out that when you integrate this, as I showed graphically in the last slide, those notches essentially go away. Um, so it's, it's really not an issue um, uh, for a real uh, clinical environment uh, there. So uh, we compared the ICRU method with the real-time probe against the TG111 method. It's the same probe with a different electrometer, um, and you can see we uh, achieved uh, uh, a pretty good um, correspondence between the two measurement techniques. So in summary, uh, uh, we, in, a, in this discussion of measurements and indices and CT dose, we talked about CTDI based methods and why they need to be updated. We talked about this uh, SSDE, uh, the output of uh, TG204, and it's also a chapter in the ICRU report that adjusts for patient size. We talked about the scan length dependency, H of L, and that's t uh, uh, described in t uh, TG111 also in the ICRU report. We talked about the phantoms um, and faster uh, radiation meters, and that's also discussed in TG200, um, et cetera. And uh, the methods for automating the size uh, calculation is still an active task group uh, chaired by Cynthia McCullough, TG220. And they've really done a lot of work already, and that task group uh, should be ready to uh, um, be published uh, in the not too distant uh, future. And I'll just point out that the ICRU report, which sort of discuss discusses everything I mentioned here today, uh, should be order, uh, available third quarter this year. Thank you for your attention. Okay, we're going to take some questions now. Anybody have a question for John? We're also going to have an opportunity for all three of us, all three speakers, to have an interactive session at the end of this presentation. And I see Dr. Uh, Lee Goldman. Hey, John, I was just noticing that in <coughs> one of the first slides you showed the, uh, the, the tails almost a perfectly linear on your semi-log plot, okay, even within the length of a the 15 centimeter phantom. So, is it possible to just fit to that in order to get to the crate, or is that something that you're already doing? I don't know. So, we did that, and, and uh, so I actually did the Monte Carlo work, and I, I uh, gave that data to Bob, and I, I actually did the bilinear fit using some software, and, and so we, we gave him those coefficients, which are the slope coefficients of the fit. It's, re, uh, it's really just one 
um, uh, fit, the weighting factor too. So there's three parameters, and that's what led to the equations I showed you. And, and if you see the Dixon and Boone papers, there are several of them now. Um, it, t it discusses that in gory detail. Right. I understand. What I was asking is that would that fitting work even within the length of a normal, fifteen you know, a smaller fan? Um, probably not, because you're not getting the scatter, the back scatter, because uh, you know the scatter at the center of a large uh, phantom has been scattered five, six, eight times um, with decreasing uh, prevalence uh, over that range. Uh, so um, uh, what we're at, uh, but uh, to, to key on your question, what we're asking the vendors to do is to measure H of L in the longest phantom and then also to measure it in, in the short phantom to provide sort of a calibration term uh, uh, between uh, those two. That's what you're getting at, I think. Phil. This is all well and good. Yes, sir. We've got measurements being made in Europe in air. At least that's my impression. They're, they're, they've forgotten phantoms, and they just put their ion chamber in air. <clears throat> We've got a couple of phantoms. All the state is great. In fact, at one time I know that the ICRU, your stuff, you'd proposed a single small phantom, maybe 20 centimeters long, with all the uh, ACR phantom equivalent stuff for resolution and and whatever. So where is this leading? Where are we really going to go? What measurements are we going to need, and what are we going to need for a phantom? So there's an open-ended question. Um, <laughs> so in, indeed, um, it's probably fair, and, and I think that these are the sort of the recommendations of the ICRU report, and uh, I'm sure this will also be discussed in APM circles that um, when you get a new scanner for acceptance testing, you use a phantom, but you also characterize the, scan the tube output. I didn't talk about this, but we can talk offline. Um, uh, with that real-time probe, you can actually measure the output of the tube very nicely, both in the fan geometry, and I wrote a paper on that, uh, two papers on that, as well as uh, by just translating that probe through the beam and measuring what Dixon calls F of Z. And uh, you're really characterizing the X-ray beam. When you go back for acceptance testing, as long as those two measurements in air are the same, we're suggesting that you don't need to use the phantom. I mean, the, the, the dose in the phantom will only change if the dose output characteristics of the, of the tube head uh, change. And so um, ultimately, this is leading to uh, an air uh, uh, measurement. We'll see how well the community adopts that, because a lot of people are you know, sort of joined at the hip with phantoms, but uh, um, that we're also working with the IEC, which is actually the group that you probably are aware that um, makes these uh, standards. They're not a regulatory body, but they're a standards body, and oftentimes those standards are codified by the laws of all the member nations, which is most of the na na nations in the world. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, I have two questions. One, have you compared the solid state with your uh, thimble chamber, number one? And number two, I did some measurements using uh, 32 cm, three phantoms left together, and did some measurement both with the uh, do uh, CT dose pro from RTI and uh, some TLD. So I was wondering you know, if you compared those phantoms. Yes, uh, we uh, actually did a pretty a comprehensive assessment of a solid-state phantom, and I think that with work, that solid-state phantoms uh, could be made to be accurate, and if you just want the shape of the curve, they'll probably be accurate. Um, solid-state phantoms work great when you're making measurements in air because you know what the spectrum is in, in the absence of scatter. At the center of a big phantom in a CT, the scatter-to-primary ratio from Monte Carlo work that I did was 13 to 1, 13 scattered photons for every primary photon. Who knows what the energy, what this X-ray spectrum looks there? And so the energy uh, correction in that environment is very difficult and probably won't be as accurate as we would like it to be. So, given that there is air ionization technology for that, I mean that's my own bias. Uh, I know that others will end up using solid state, uh, and, and you know, of course that just becomes a calibration issue uh, at that point. Okay, thank you.